Welcome to the twelfth presentation where we're looking at what Jesus said about various topics and themes. What did Jesus say about marriage? It's certainly true that marriage is celebrated right across the cultures of the world, in diverse ways and in diverse colours, but it's certainly celebrated. Looking back to the days of Jesus, in the Jewish society of that day, most marriages were arranged. Brides tended to be very young, teenagers, mid-teens, quite typical. Marriage involved a linking of families arranged by the parents. The image in society then was that men earned to provide, while the women cared and looked after children. There was a cruel role distinction. In wider society throughout the Roman Empire, women often had little security in marriage sometimes close to property. And there was no real concept of compatibility within marriage. It was a male-orientated world. Yes, large families were the norm, but many died in infancy. Men were certainly seen as dominant and women as submissive. No equality there. Consensual homosexuality is almost never seen looking at the literature of the period. But nonetheless, men, and this was a very frequent occurrence, often abused boys and girls. Temple prostitution throughout the various temples in the Roman Empire was certainly not uncommon. While polygamy and concubinage, where you could have multiple wives or ladies in your life, for men these were both acceptable. Women were never asked. So that's the pattern and background into which Jesus came. Now he was brought up in an artisan family in a backwater of the empire, Nazareth in the northern part of Israel. Yes, there was a family. He had younger brothers and sisters. The brothers are named. Throughout his life, he treated women with great respect and honour. He certainly did not regard them as property or inferior in any way. In his teaching, which is limited, he emphasised God's ideal in marriage and in stable marriage. But when things went wrong, he took steps in his teaching but also in practice to seek to protect women who were often vulnerable when things fell apart. In Matthew 19 there's a record of Jesus being presented with a kind of a trick question designed to catch him out. Now the background for this lies in the principle of marriage permanency. This goes right back to Genesis where it says this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Now that word united could equally well be translated cemented together, glued, welded together. It's a very strong word and that suggests permanency was what God intended. But in the book of Deuteronomy it says if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house and it goes on. That suggests that divorce is possible. But you've got to read it in context, complete the rest of the section. Because it's speaking about the abuse of divorce, not the principle of divorce. And it's putting limitations on that abuse for the protection of the woman. 
Now, what happened here was this background was used to trick Jesus. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? They chose their words carefully. Haven't you read? Jesus replied that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and has said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together let no one separate. Goes back to that quotation from Genesis. Pharisees come back at him. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Now that is a twisting of the test. It isn't a command, it's an if clause in the original. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. In other words, if things go wrong, it's a possibility. But it was not this way from the beginning. It's not God's ideal. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So when things go badly wrong, yet divorce is possible. Not ideal, but possible. But the central reason is sexual unfaithfulness. So a man can't just throw a woman out in order to marry another woman, a younger woman usually. So there were restrictions which was to protect women in societies where men dominated. The key rests in that. They used their words carefully for any and every reason. And Jesus answered it at the end, showing that it's for sexual unfaithfulness. You see, it's a clever trick. If divorce could be claimed for any and every reason, then the man could keep the dowry. He could blame the woman, and a man could marry, get a dowry, get rid of his wife, keep the dowry, take another wife, get rid of her, keep the dowry, and become very rich. And that was happening in the days of Jesus. In another part, Jesus said this, It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Now that's a protection, it's a public statement of reason to stop a man just getting rid of a wife at a whim. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he puts restrictions and that's there to protect the women from the whims of men. Now that's the background teaching. In the Jewish society of the day, well, divorce did happen. It was permitted. Marriage usually was permanent and stable. But it was biased. Now we've broken free from that bias today in most societies, although strictly speaking in Islamic societies only men can divorce. In practice it means that in fact men can divorce their wives easily, but women find it very, very much harder. But in the days of Jesus the safeguards had slipped and women were being abused as a result. Men were abusing their power. Now this is God's ideal. See it positively as God's ideal. We don't always match up to it, but it's God's ideal. Marriage is a lifelong commitment and women are to be protected within marriage. They are not possessions. They are to be respected. That's the beginnings of laying the foundations of equality which we've got closer to today. When things go badly wrong, but only for sexual reasons, divorce is possible rather than suffer. But divorce is for marriage unfaithfulness, not just for any whim that a man might have.
And even there, women are to be protected. Otherwise, you end up with women thrown out at a whim, without money, and in the society of the day, without the means of earning money easily at all, and perhaps with children to provide for. This was all part of the protection of people, all people. Now, this was the move that Jesus was making towards equality, compatibility, looking at marriage as a partnership of e equals. God's ideal. Now, he pictures this as kingdom principles. In the kingdom of God, the ideal, the pattern, that's the norm. He never lays it down as the rule. He does allow for celibacy. And divorce is possible when things go badly wrong due to unfaithfulness within the marriage bond. But that's the norm. Permanent. That's God's ideal. And it's God's ideal because it brings the greatest happiness and security for both the man and the woman equally. They have both got roles in life. They work together as equals within the marriage. And the evidence shows that that provides the most stable setting for the upbringing of children. Despite what media presentations sometimes suggest today. The research evidence is very clear. But things do go wrong. We humans are far from perfect. Things do go wrong. Selfishness comes in. We make bad mistakes. We do foolish things. Things do go wrong. And God still wants the best for us. So there's a provision there for that. So divorce is allowed if that total union, that gluing together, cementing together, if that's been broken, if there's been cheating within the marriage in some way, then rather than live in brutal unhappiness, it's better to go their separate ways. But within that, there has to be equality and protection. So the conditions are unfaithfulness, not just the whim of a man, and that is so often tragically what has happened historically and still happens today. And women are abused and suffer. That's never God's intention. We are all of equal value before God, men and women. All of equal value. And God wants the best for us all. That's the principle. And that's the principle underpinning all the teaching of Jesus, including the teaching on marriage. God wants and seeks the best for us at all times, but he recognizes that sometimes we do mess up and we sometimes mess up badly. But in trying to get out of that mess, the pattern is that we don't abuse each other in the process. God is love. If you look at the biblical teaching overall, and the teaching of Jesus is totally consistent with this, it is countercultural. It was countercultural in the days of Jesus, where men dominated, could virtually do what they wanted, boys and girls were abused throughout the culture of the Roman Empire. And women were treated largely as possessions. Jesus challenges all that. He's implying an equality. He's moving people's thoughts towards that equality. It took a long time for it to come. And in the West it has come at least in large measure. But that's not true in all cultures and societies. But if you look at the evidence, the biblical teaching is not irrational. It's seeking the best. The family unit is the foundation of a strong, secure society. 
The evidence shows it. Modern evidence, historical evidence. It's maybe countercultural, maybe goes against the political correctness of today, but it's not irrational. It doesn't contradict the evidence. Yes, men have a basic drive and they have a need for women. Part of that's the powerful sexual drive, but it's more than that. Men were created for women, but women were created for men. The need for security, warmth, love and protection. But the need for equality. It's a two-way equality process. Paul, commenting on all of this, speaks about the way Jesus has broken down the great barriers of the society of his day. There were three great barriers, and one of them was the gender barrier. And Paul stresses all equal in Christ. Men and women, equal value, equal respect. And we have to work that through in the culture and the lifestyle societies of modern living. You can summarize it this way. Each was made for the other. Now that's in no way to put down those who have chosen a path of celibacy. We've got to follow the way that we're led or the way life circumstances have taken us. But as a general principle of life, each is made for the other. But in marriage, there's an equality in this partnership. And there's a completeness in this partnership. Glued together, bolted together, one unit working together. But within that unit, <clears throat> there's a distinct identity for men and women. The psychology is different. It's complementary. It's teamwork. It's equality. That's what Jesus taught about marriage. And the biblical picture is positive. Tragically, there's too much negative things flying around, often misquoting bits of the Bible or taking them out of context. The biblical model of marriage is positive. It doesn't seem to put down anybody who doesn't fall into that. It makes provision for the common breakdown which leads to divorce. That people are protected, especially the women, in the culture of his day. God wants the best for us. He wants us to have fulfilled and happy lives. Marriage, for most, will be part of that. And God wants the best for us. And we need to then to stress the positive image that Jesus has given of this without in any way criticizing, condemning those who fail to match up to that positive model. We all make a mess of things at times. We're in no position to condemn others. The Bible picture is positive, affirmative, supportive, wishing the best and protecting everybody from anything that could spoil it. What Jesus taught about marriage. The next presentation we're going to look about what Jesus said about violence.